to introduce Jane. And I'm going to tell a story that's going to embarrass both of us. Oh, darn. Uh, a few years ago, I was running an online course on systems administration and scripting languages. It was online, so there was nobody there, and it was very boring. And then this lady who was taking the course also got bored with being by herself, and we ended up sitting next to each other doing the course online. Okay? And we started chatting. Yes, we did. And it was a, a second conversation. It was jokes, mainly, as I recall. Well, I knew that, that I belonged when you said that the librarian says, ooh. And that meant that he was reading Terry Pratchett books, which I love him. And the librarian at Unseen University says, ooh. And this has nothing to do with the fact that she gave me a penguin at the end of the quarter. Yes, but I get to say that when I came in with the penguin, he holds it up like, he says, you shouldn't have done it. And I said, no, if I do it on my own nickel, I should have done it anyway, and it wasn't that expensive. And he goes, no change in grade, no change in grade, no change in grade, no change in grade. And it didn't change the grade. Anyway, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Jane. I'll now hand over to Yasha, who is the advisor on this project. Yes. Oh, here is the sign-up sheet. If you are a student, sign up. Uh, wherever the stack wound up, if you would put it up here, so that people coming in can, can pick yeah, up one. Yeah, the handouts. Whoever comes yeah. in will pick one up. I don't have a sign that says drink me, but that's good Hang enough. On to the, in the appropriate direction. All right, well, we should get started momentarily. A bit of history, which will also probably embarrass Ms. Kerner. But when she originally arrived here, she was an undergraduate and as you might guess, a re-entrant student, uh, working as a repair maintenance technician with the U.S. Postal so Service, and was taking a remote degree from an accredited university back east, but needed courses out here. Right. And she stayed around, and she got her bachelor's, and she started the graduate program, and she started research, and she changed research projects a couple of times, and she's finished a research project, which, were it not for the fact that it's illegal for the CSU to offer PhD degrees, would, with minor fleshing, actually be a PhD thesis. But that's life. At any rate, you're going to see something that crosses between biology and computer science. And mm -hmm. mathematics, I would and say. Mathematics, I would say. Except mathematics is part of computer science, or the mm -hmm. other way around, whichever way you want to view it. All right? Oh, from your point of view. Yes. Good point. Point it, of view is important in this, too. Mm -hmm. Because mathematics, well, much of what we develop in computer science is mathematics, and some of it is even recognized by mathematicians, all right? Because computer science will revolve from three different disciplines, mathematics, well, electrical see, engineering, yes. and, hmm? okay. and those groups that use computers a lot, primarily physics, and a few other uh, disciplines. Anyway, with the I'd like to add one thing before you start, sure. which Yasha forgot to mention. During this checkered career that Jane has had, she, before getting her master's degree, she has also managed to put, to get uh, to co-author four refereed published conference papers and one book chapter. Yes. So. And fix a supercomputer cluster for NASA. Yes. yes. So. There is that. I've had the opportunity to work for two different groups of, of NASA people at, at uh, <coughs> NASA Dryden, which was the first project I was talking about that I changed from. Mm -hmm. And through good fortune and good timing, met a group of people from NASA Ames who throw a spaceward bound every year at Zizix that lasts for a week. It's a combined research and educational outreach. And I've been, thank you, Lord. And thank you, Chris McKay, a guest scientist out there for the last four years. So, pretty cool stuff here. As a matter of fact, let me tell you a little story, since everybody's telling stories. We started doing this cellular automata stuff back in 2006. In 2007, I got to go to Space for Bound the first time. Did a presentation, and we put the wrong 
pattern up the first time, pulled it down, put the right one up the second time because the guy I was presenting with was nervous, I was nervous, you know. And there's a hundred people in the room, trust me. A hundred people in the room. A uh, lady comes up, probably my age maybe, a little younger, and says, hey, uh, my buddy Mike and I, he and I agree, we've seen that pattern. You what? Ah, we've seen that pattern. Where did you see it? Um, on the walls in um, sulfuric acid caves? Don't know if I believe you, Penny, but let me think about it. And we talk some more, and it turns out that the way it evolves is very similar to how the cellular automata evolves. And darn, we've been publishing with Penny Boston from New Mexico Tech ever since. It's been a really good collaboration with her, and I'm, I'm pleased to have been there, pleased to have worked with Chris McKay and Penny Boston both. And that having been said, let's, let's proceed. We've got a cellular automata vocabulary here to talk about. The first thing about the automata we're using is basically, unless you inject randomness in cellular automata, there isn't any randomness. It proceeds and, and develops the same way every single time that you do it. The patterns that we chose to use are synchronous. The entire grid area is updated all at the same time. There's no asynchronous update to it. It all happens. We're working from one grid to a second grid, and then when we get them all finished, we just swap them. So it all happens at one time. These particular ones are totalistic. That means that you take all of the neighbors in the neighborhood, and we'll talk about neighborhood in a minute, sum up the one or the zero that's in each one of them because we're only using two values. And that sum, when compared against the birth and death rule, determines whether the cell in the middle whose value isn't counted lives or dies in the next time step. Neighborhoods. A couple different popular neighborhoods are the Moore neighborhood on square grid and the von Neumann neighborhood. And I'll show you pictures of those in a minute. A uh, couple more things we want to talk about. We want to talk about radius and calculation radius, which are basically the same thing. This is another picture that we'll show you, but that has to do with the size of the neighborhood and the number of different cells that are within the neighborhood based on the radius. And it's really important in how this stuff develops. If you pick a larger neighborhood, your pattern's going to develop larger. Uh, it's one of the things we discovered on this. The target square is the one cell in the very middle of the neighborhood. I don't care how big the neighborhood is. So you're summing everybody else in the neighborhood to find out what just one cell does. And the rules, we have birth and death rules. And that one didn't happen. Okay, let's go back here. Okay, this looks like this isn't the current version. You want to go out to the drop box and grab it? Yeah, I think I would prefer to. Why don't you spend a minute. moment and get it, because I grabbed it. Yes. Yeah. It takes just a second. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's escape out of this. In accordance with Murphy's laws, presentations must go wrong. Of course like they everything must. Else. Okay. We're going to close this.